Hello, this is Dr. Steve Johnson, and um, I will be lecturing on Church Home Counseling, Module 7. The topic is Cognitive, Emotive, and Behavioral um, Interventions. Um, first, I want to look at cognitive interventions. Now, we've already looked at cognitive restructuring, which was about the how we go about using disputing of uh, irrational or unhelpful beliefs. We've gone through the entire process of identifying those irrational, unhelpful beliefs and even what to do if a client gives us an um, inference rather than a belief and we do an inference chain to actually get to the belief. But um, there's more to um, the cognitive interventions than just uh, cognitive restructuring. So let's take a look at uh, a few of those. Of course, the first one that we've discussed in some detail is uh, debating. And we've looked at how to do the uh, types of debating, the pragmatic or functional, the empirical, the logical, and then of course the uh, friendship. And then there's the style for doing that, which would include the Socratic method or the didactic, um, metaphorical, humorous, etc. So um, we, you already know how to do those. I'm going to assume that you know that and then I'm going to uh, move on. We also use rational coping statements, and these are very, very good. These are small phrases, very short phrases that um, kind of capture a rational idea, of, particularly one that may be an alternative to a common irrational or unhelpful uh, belief that a client has a, a occur within their head over and over and over again on numerous occasions. It is better if we, um, if the client identifies a short phrase with, you know, maybe with some guidance from the counselor or therapist, uh, because it is, it's much more meaningful than if the therapist just assigns a rational coping statement. So for example, one of the ones that um, I frequently use and even use it as a screensaver on my computer is, this is just a hassle, it's not a horror. And so that, um, um, and, and so kind of I'm often going, oh, this is horrible. Uh, then I can have this appear several times a day while I may be even working. So that's a short uh, coping statement. Some people like to use a phrase um, from scripture or, you know, something from a um, movie or whatever. But it's really important that it, one, it is rational uh, and two, that it is meaningful um, to the client. Now, I often rely upon these fairly heavily early on before the client has developed some facility in doing the uh, debating. Um, and so uh, that we will work on a short phrase that the individual can use. And maybe that just pulls them back out of the situation enough so that they calm down and then uh, realize that, okay, it might be helpful if I think a little bit more rationally in this uh, situation. Later on, the individual can um, can actually do the uh, debate and try to, um, you know, minimize the uh, frequency, intensity, and duration of those unhelpful uh, beliefs uh, over, over time. But some people find rational coping statements to be helpful through, um, throughout their lives. So that is one good one. Another one is called modeling. This is how we as a therapist can model for um, someone else um, how to behave. Or um, really nice, and I find this one really helpful for children and sometimes for adolescents, is to choose someone who is um, they look up to or as a model for them. It could be, you know, a movie star or 
um, a musician, etc. And so um, let's say that we have someone, a client who's really highly anxious, like generalized anxiety disorder. So they're anxious about a number of things. And so we might ask them, well, who would be someone that shows up in the movie that is really uh, courageous? Or let's say that some uh, someone struggling with social anxiety, a young man is having great difficulty asking a young lady out for a date or something. And so we would ask, um, uh, who would be a movie star that might be really good at that? And I've had students say, well, Ryan, Ryan Gosling or somebody like that. So they, um, they just kind of watch that person and they try to get into that character and act like that uh, character and that helps relieve the anxiety or whatever um, they are experiencing. Referenting is um, another great technique that I use rather frequently, in fact. This is where we have um, them kind of do a cost-benefit analysis or pros and cons of doing, uh, doing something, especially the cost-benefit analysis of giving up on a uh, irrational, unhelpful belief and adopting one that's more rational. So, um, you know, for example, one of the pros might be, okay, then my emotion might be more in check and I might engage in behaviors that are more adaptive and help me reach my goals. Um, a um, negative here, um, a, you know, or liability might be, ah, it's going to feel strange and weird and it's not how I normally think. Okay, yeah, so that would be a con or, um, you know, a negative about it. So uh, looking at the cost benefit analysis, so then most people would realize that changing that uh, unhelpful, or, <coughs> excuse me, irrational belief has greater um, benefits than cost. Proselytizing is one that Albert Ellis himself recommended. And uh, again, this is very helpful during, especially during this stage when an, a client is learning the ABC model. So they've gained some facility and understand it generally, but they need to practice it. And so one of the ways to do this is to teach someone else the model. In fact, those of us who are professors or teachers know that when we teach some someone else, that we're rehearsing, rehearsing it ourselves and it helps us just as much, if not more, than someone else. It becomes more habitual. So we often have the client um, teach family, friends, whatever, without being you know, intrusive or um, burdensome, the um, teach them the ABC model and even how to use it. It's a great way to learn that to learn that model. Reframing is a technique that doesn't so much change a belief or replace it as it does help the client at the level of inference. Because when we reframe a um, reframe something. I mean, we could reframe a belief, but it's easy to reframe an inference. Um, so for example, if I'm highly anxious about something, notice um, that I'm uh, uh, kind of uh, attributing to a situation that it's a threat. So one thing that we could do in, instead of framing it as a threat or interpreting a situation as a threat, we could interpret it as, oh, this is just a challenge or this is an exciting event. So by changing or reframing, giving a different significance and meaning to the event, we can uh, perhaps avoid some of the negative beliefs being attached to the new, uh, the new inference. So that's well worth trying. Now, keep in mind, uh, we, um, uh, CBT is, does much more work at the level of inference than REBT does, but we do realize the power in the, uh, the inference and at times how helping a client to reframe and adopt a new uh, kind of inference about a state of affairs or a situation um, uh, can be quite, be quite, quite helpful. So those are some of the cognitive interventions. There are many, many more, but 
The next category that I want to consider are the emotive interventions. Now, the emotive interventions are designed to do just that, to generate emotion, because remember in the ABC model that we have the, um, that we believe that there's a dynamic interconnection and not a linear connection between situations, um, uh, beliefs and emotions, uh, behaviors, and even physiological responses. So the, the good news is that if we change the belief, we will change the emotion and change the behavior. If we change the behavior, we're going to be changing the, um, you know, the other two, etc., because they're interconnected. And so while it can be very uh, efficient and perhaps a bit easier to work at the level of cognition with those cognitive interventions, some uh, clients find it these emotive interventions to be even more powerful for them. So it's really a good idea when we are doing counseling or therapy with somebody or, you know, spiritual counseling or um, any, in, you know, just anything that is kind of uh, helping an individual change their worldview or beliefs about something that we give a, uh, a variety of types so that we can give the client some options and they can experiment to find which the ones are most effective for them. So let's look at those, some of the emotive interventions. One that many of us find very helpful is what's called rational, rational emotive imagery. Now, rational emotive imagery has two parts. What we do in rational emotive imagery, in the first part, uh, we usually will choose something that with which the client is struggling uh, or is struggling right now or re has been recently struggling with this. And so what we do is we will have them visualize, you know, a situation maybe that happened really recently about which they disturbed themselves. So let's say that there's um, a situation where, again, if we go back to one that we've used throughout the course, the individual has just been fired, you know, from a job. So that's a situation we would have the client envision that as, as vividly as possible, right? And get, and, and to try to bring up the emotion that they actually had at the time of the uh, original firing. So let's say that emotion was anger. So we would say, okay, visualize that and get in touch with that anger, okay? And feel that anger as much as, as much as possible. And then as soon as you get in touch with that emotion, just let me know. Um, as a counselor, I'm saying that to them. So, um, and then I want you to stop, okay? So they've gotten in touch with the anger. And so they told us and we have them stop. We have them calm down again. And then we will have them, um, you know, when they've, when they've reached their kind of um, level emotional state, then we have them um, visualize the very same situation again. But this time what we tell them is instead of anger, we want them to visualize getting very annoyed and frustrated by that uh, situation, by the getting fired. They're, they're really annoyed, they're frustrated, but not angry, okay? And then as soon as they um, are able to do that, then um, we have them stop. And then when we stop, we kind of process that with them and we go, okay, what change did you make so that in your visualization, so that you could make yourself feel annoyance and frustration rather than the anger. The value of this is one, many people believe that they have no control over their emotions, that the, acti the um, critical activating event uh, is the cause of that emotion. And so we're helping them see, no, you have a little more control over the emotion than you actually um, than you actually realize. And so they are not only learning that, but when we check with how they did that, that is something that they could do 
um, in another in another uh, situation. So we would have them practice this rational mode of imagery. Um, we may have them do that uh, once a day, etc., and um, at, at at a convenient uh, time and and practice this so that when they're actually in a situation again, they may be able to do it and have a more um, adaptive and functional kind of emotional and, and behavioral response to the activating event. Uh, forceful coping statements. Now, we've talked about short coping statements, but if we want to put an emotive component to that, what we might do is say, say this, you know, as loudly and forcefully as you can, that coping statement. I often think of, um, you know, the of Tom Cruise when he got engaged to um, his uh, uh, first wife and uh, he went on the Oprah show and he's jumping up and, on, and down on the couch and he's saying, you know, he's announcing it. That was a very forceful uh, statement. And so this is not necessarily jump up and down on the couch, but um, in a very forceful and loud way, you might be in the in your home and state it with uh, all kinds of energy. Now, if you live in an apartment, be careful. You don't want to disturb the neighbors and that kind of thing. We, um, I've had clients do it on the subway, but that's New York. Nobody, nobody really cares there. They'll just move away from you and give you a little more space because they're wondering about you. Okay, but forceful coping statements is a wonderful kind of emotive, emotive technique. Another one is role play. Um, this one, you know, it's just a typical role play. So let's say they, again, that they're angry about getting fired. So we might play that with them um, where, you know, I would play the boss and they would play themselves and we would have them play that over until they, and, and work on an adaptive response, you know, a change in the emotion and um, and 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 because it will gen the role play can generate the emotion sometimes it is very helpful in that in that way. Another one is rational role reversal, and this is one of my absolute favorites because this <clears throat> uh, clients like it. It's kind of fun for them. The young clients, the teenagers, etc., sometimes can get really really get into it. In a rational role reversal, what we do is. I tell them, I tell the client, be your most rational uh, self. And I'm going to be, I'm going to play your most irrational self. And I want you, every time I say something irrational, to counter me with something that's rational. Okay. Now we don't, and it's very important that you have you, the, the counselor, the client, I mean, the therapist, play the role of their rational, uh, of, no, of their irrational self and they play their rational self. We don't want them practicing their irrational self. So always the, the rational, uh, rational self. And it can be great fun and you, and I, you know, you know, I can really get into the character and, you know, kind of exaggerate it. And not only is it a helpful intervention, it's also a helpful diagnostic tool. Because when we do the rational re role reversal, sometimes the client will get stuck and will not won't be able to think of a response. And part of the reason that they won't be able to think of the response is that they really believe the irrational statement that I just made. And so it helps me to identify the those irrational and helpful statements and we can begin to work on those. So this is helpful early on um, to, uh, to a, as a diagnostic tool, diagnosing the unhelpful belief, as well as an, uh, an intervention to try to change those uh, 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 maladaptive beliefs. Humor is another way, and I've already given some caution about using humor. This one we don't do very early in the therapy. You really have to know the client. And sometimes if the client does have a personality disorder, then uh, we have to be very, very cautious. And keep in mind also that what is humorous for one person may not be humorous for another. People have different senses of humor. And this is especially true if we're doing cross-cultural counseling because sometimes another culture 
you know, it just has a totally different sense of uh, sense of humor. The other thing is, it's very, very important that the humor is always directed at the client's belief, never at the client herself or himself, because then they can feel that you're making fun of them or attacking them whatsoever. So be very cautious with them, but at times it can be very, very um, uh, helpful. Unconditional other acceptance by the therapist. One of the things that we can model and it's and um, really helpful is that, you know, if a client gets upset with us or they're really annoyed with us or whatever, we practice unconditionally accepting them and we voice that. And we can even point that out, how we were able to do that by the beliefs that we are holding about that other, about them, about the client. And so by modeling it, they can begin to, you know, they can begin to kind of copy that. Um, our psychodynamic um, friends or colleagues say that they're micro internalizing our structure. I don't know about that, but at least we hope that they are learning how to unconditionally accept the other person. This is really, really helpful, especially when a client has uh, anger, because um, in anger, typically there's the global negative uh, evaluation or rating of the other person. So this one is really, really helpful in uh, cases of anger. Now, since we've, we've now gone over the uh, some general kind of cognitive interventions and emotive interventions, I want to look at the behavioral interventions. And I really enjoy this as a category of invention, uh, interventions. And um, it's helpful to know the theory of emotions. And I know I keep saying this, but it's so true to know the theory of emotions. Because in that theory of emotions, remember, for each particular emotion, there, we know that there are particular inferences, there are particular, um, you know, typical unhelpful, uh, irrational beliefs, and each emotion has an, a particular action or behavioral tendency associated with it. Knowing those behavioral or action tendencies, we can create a behavioral intervention that will um, address those. And so, these are very, very, very powerful, especially if the individual is doesn't seem to be making much progress or as much as we would like with the cognitive and inner uh, emotive interventions, then we can begin to work at the level of the behavioral interventions. One of those is reinforcements and punishments. Now, one of the things I often do is with that rational emotive imagery, remember that's the one that's divided into two parts. In the first part, they visual the client visualizes a particular situation and gets in touch with the dysfunctional emotion, stops, calms down, and then um, uh, re-visualizes the very same uh, activating event, critical activating event, but this time they are um, guided to get in touch with a more adaptive or helpful negative, uh, negative emotion. Um, and we ask the client to do that at least once a day at a time that's convenient for them. And sometimes we will put reinforcements and punishments around that. So I might say, um, do the imagery every night by seven o'clock. They've agreed upon seven o'clock. And if you don't, if you do it, then reward yourself, give yourself some kind of reinforcement, something that you enjoy, and uh, maybe won't cost a lot or take a lot of time. So for example, if the client says, oh, I would like to have, you know, um, you know a, um, uh, a particular kind of sweet or a piece of candy or a cup of coffee or whatever it is, uh, maybe not best to drink coffee at, uh, at 7 p.m. unless it's decaf, but um, something that's reinforcing. But if they don't do it by seven o'clock, we can have them, uh, we're going to have them do something that they don't normally like to do. And so we even ask, what is something that you do nearly every day or several times a week and you really dislike, um, you really dislike doing it? So they might say, oh, I really dislike uh, cleaning the toilet. So we say, okay, you don't do it by seven o'clock, then you got to go clean the, uh, clean the toilets. 
And if that isn't bad enough, you know, you do it and you go, ah, this isn't so bad. Then just knock on your neighbor's door and offer to clean their toilet. OK, and so that might uh, dissuade you from not doing that. So reinforcements and punishment. So very behavioral. We're going first wave behaviorism on um, on this. Um, I'm sorry, it, this should say shame attack. The shame attack is one, uh, I've already given you an example of a shame attack. This is where you do something that you wouldn't normally do because it might be a little awkward or shaming, you know, nothing illegal, immoral, nothing that would get you into trouble, nothing would get you fired, uh, something like that, not you get you locked up in jail, but just something that's a little off, for example, um, some of the traditional shame attacks that Albert Ellis came up with were like um, uh, uh, putting a banana on a leash and walking it around Central Park or going into the elevator and facing the back of the elevator, maybe making um, noises like an alien or something like that. Or one that I did was I went into a deli, you know, where they give you a, a you know, kind of a, a, a holder or some uh, a container for the food and I would put one grape in there and then I'd go up and have them weigh it and ask them if I could get a knife and a fork with that you know not something that I would normally uh, normally do to and it, it is really helpful a shame attack can be very powerful for overcoming uh, anxiety but you do have to remember nothing immoral nothing that would get the person in trouble um, etc et Skills training is another one. Sometimes an individual just has problems because they lack certain skills. So, for example, social skills training for some individuals. I, I ran a group for young men who were, had uh, um, autism and um, were, that struggled with social skills training. So we learned things. Uh, th these were young men who wanted to go to a prom. And so part of the social skills was how to ask a young lady out uh for a, on a date or to go to the prom etc so um very 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 helpful um teach someone skills when that's the one of the issues that helps them to attain their life goals relapse prevention is one that we typically use with some kind of addictions counseling but it doesn't have to be with addictions but it, it we always do it with uh, with an addiction so one of these would be um, the person has made progress in the in sobriety and down the road for um, making uh, improvements in the in, in the addiction and, and dealing with it. And so what we're doing toward the end of the therapy is preparing them for the reality that they will encounter triggers and they there will be times when they will feel like using. And so we would look at what would be those thoughts that they might have that would be motivating them in a negative way to relapse. And so we could develop some strategies for what to do if those thoughts do appear, um, you know, whenever there's a particular trigger uh, around, uh, what can they do? How could they get other people involved to help them, all kinds of things for relapse prevention. Very, very helpful um, for an individual. It's also quite good in, uh, P in treating PTSD. One that is I like is um, acting upon a rational and helpful belief. So um, instead of spending sometimes a whole lot of time on helping them challenge and replacing debating and replacing the unhelpful, irrational belief, we can have them practice uh, acting out or acting into, we sometimes say, the rational belief. So this one is so powerful that for some clients, this alone helps them, helps them do that. And it's kind of on years ago when they had the WWJD, what would Jesus do? And then you would have them do that. This is acting rationally. You could do it with acting morally or anything else, but since the model is really about rationality, we focus on the rational and the uh, helpful. 
but you could adapt that to anything that would be helping an individual become more effective in um, in life and enjoy life a little bit more. So very helpful, very helpful for them to, um, you know, to uh, to do that. Another one that is quite good is helping someone to develop frustration tolerance. That is by staying in, in a difficult situation. Now, not an abusive one, not where they're getting harmed. That's a totally different story. But this is one where it's not abusive, but it's, um, you know, maybe difficult. So, for example, let's say um, a student um, uh, doesn't like to put in a lot of effort, etc., and they get very frustrated when they have to put in the effort. So we might have them take a class and even though it may be highly frustrating for them and they may have to do a lot of studying, we say, you know, stay in that difficult situation and see if you can make yourself not so frustrated and watch the thoughts that you have that would have you sabotage yourself and drop out of a class that may actually be helpful for you in the long run. So staying in a difficult situation. We often use this with someone who doesn't like the job, um, is having a little trouble with getting along with people, and but it's not egregious. They're not harming them, the, the um, client or whatever. So we're saying, why don't you stay in the situation and not disturb yourself so much about it? And when you can stay, when you're in the situation and you no longer um, feel disturbed about the situation then if you want to then if you want to move on and look for another job then then do that and sometimes they even decide well you know it's not that bad I'll just stick stick with the uh, stick with the situation so staying in a difficult situation is a great behavioral behavioral tool so that's it for the interventions there are many others but that's what I will be covering this time if you have any questions feel free to get a hold of me and uh, have a wonderful day